Welcome to Sunday night on Asase 99.5 in Accra, 98.5 in Kumasi, 99.7 in Tamale, and 100.3 in Cape Coast, as well as affiliates across Ghana and streaming internationally to an African diasporic audience on Facebook, also on YouTube Extra, to Asase 99.5. And we are hosts today, or rather we're being hosted by a gentleman with some interesting thoughts about the economic development and direction of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, particularly post-COVID. He's Pat Bimbatia, Senegalese-born independent economist, development expert, and financier who focuses on developing industrial value chains. He previously had a long-term stint as a private sector development specialist with the World Bank and has consulted for a host of international organizations from the United Nations Industrial Development Organization to GEIZ, German Development Association, and the OECD to the Swiss Federal Office for External Economic Affairs as well as the grouping now known as the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, based in Brussels. Before all that, he worked in academia, starting out as a researcher at the Université de Neuchâtel. Born and raised in Senegal, he lived on and off in Switzerland for the better part of 30 years, but always kept at least one eye on sub-Saharan Africa, and in the past five years has reverted to spending the better part of his time on the African continent. So welcome to Sunday Night with Pat Dimba Tim. So Dr. Tian, thank you very much for making the time to join us uh, at the end of a very busy day when I think you've had back-to-back -back meetings. Uh, you are en route to Senegal at the moment, uh, stopped over in Accra, which is like a, a semi-second home to you, would you say? Of course, yeah. How long have you been visiting them for? This time? No, uh, when was your very first time you came to a farm? Wow, so you are reviving very bad old souvenirs. Uh, first time I came to Accra was in 1988, uh, when I was a private entrepreneur developing value chains. And I wanted to develop some fishery based value chains uh, in, in Togo and in uh, Lingat after having done a few of them in Senegal. So, this is what led me to discover Ghana for the first time. And uh, to be honest with you, this is because I was kind of cooked and had lost money that I decided to focus my attention on fixing problems here. Yeah. This is why when uh, I got into more official positions, when I had the possibility to influence what is going on in terms of a business climate, I tried to channel uh, some efforts to, to that. That was the very first time I started to, to work on Ghana. And of course, in my different uh, further incarnations, anytime it was possible to get opportunity to address issues pertaining to economic development, I was ready to do so. It always takes somebody to get a slap <laughs> in order to, 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 to reconvene and try to do best, the best thing instead of being kind of uh, bitter. Uh, so I, I thought that I should have used my experience uh, to, to try to avoid other people who to break their legs. Well, that's very generous of you. Uh, and it's interesting that you, as you said, you came to the business of more official engagement with Ghana, the work that you've done with free zones and development of those in Ghana, which perhaps we'll speak a little bit more about later on in the conversation, through hands on experience of business, actually just doing business in an African environment. The 1980s in Accra must have been a very different environment business wise from the one that we found we find now. Um, how do you think it's changed and is that for the better or for worse? I think um, uh, Rollins, uh, may God have his soul, 
has done a lot of things in the country. Of course, his first years was terrible because everybody was afraid of even showing that you, you want to do business to make money. It was like at that time, like if making money was a city, right? So there was a lot of brutality. Uh, but in the final analysis, maybe uh, himself, if he had to think about it in retrospect, there are things he would have done better. But uh, there is a conversation I had with him, I remember, when he said, you guys need to help me build institutions, strong institutions. That makes it that even when the devil comes to power, he cannot, uh, he cannot leave this institution. And I think in this, uh, in this area, he succeeded. Uh, we say in French, we cannot make omelets without breaking eggs. He broke, uh, big brother broke a lot of eggs, but at the end of the day, I think that we contributed to developing an institutional platform. Uh, Ghana should be proud of because you build really good institutions, even if in the adventure of development, there is always a lot of things to do. Uh, um, an interesting assessment and looking back from the point of view of your personal engagement. Um, and very much in keeping with what Barack Obama said in this country when he visited in 2009 uh, in his address to Parliament that what Ghana needs and what Africa needs is strong institutions, not strong men. Uh, some would argue that uh, the good military government in general in Africa should be, should be say, for the mid-1960s through the 1970s, you see residual versions of the same thing even into the early 21st century in parts of Africa. But the era of military government in which it's been destroyed the entrepreneurial spirit of many sub Saharan African countries. Uh, and that the mindset of wealth generation, which you need to develop to actually spur development, has been knocked out of sub Saharan Africa. To what extent would you agree with that? Look, uh, this is not only about military government, it's about authoritarian rule. Because uh, there are military that tend to power by controlling the means of violence, direct control of the means of violence, meaning you have the arms, you impose your weapon. But there is also institutional violence. Uh, that when people have rigged institutions, they have hijacked the means of power, control justice, control army, control everything. This is a dictatorship by the institution. So the problem we are having in Africa is that this type of, these two types of dictatorship, direct, blunt, and bold dictatorship through the direct control of the means of violence, or Controlling the mean of violence in the more um, in the in the more subliminal way of doing it is even more pernicious because you give a semblance of democracy while you are actually uh, in serious dictatorship. And unfortunately, uh, our Western partners have encouraged this type of uh, institutional dictatorship. Quasi in many African or Francophone African countries. This is why you are now coming to situations where you have the same, the same thing. You have some uh, head of state that thinks that a constitution, whenever you change a comma, you have reset the button. This is only in Africa, people will say, because we have gone to a referendum that changed the comma or a semicolon in the, in the constitution, that the history was totally reset to zero, and even if the guy was in his last term, he would say, I'm starting a new term. So and the international community that is always prompt to giving us lessons and, and showing us the way is quite silent about that. But actually, in many cases, these are their experts, Western experts that are organizing this type of, uh, of things. And this is why uh, we've never stopped to be colonized. Uh, we were slaves, we were colonized, and when they said we were independent, they organized to put their own people with their own adv ad advisors to keep on 
ruling our country by proxy, by by creating what I call institutional mona, uh, monarchy, monarchy. But as you say, monarchy or monarchy. So, so that is the problem we are having. But now, uh, this logic has run its course because it has supported what I call manufacturing poverty. And now they manufacture even structural poverty in Africa to bring us to the situation where people have no other option than starving and begging while sitting on the midst of bed. So this has created a situation where revolution and revolt are looming quasi all over the place. And what has happened in, in terms of the mismanagement of COVID? Because I've never seen somebody who's been killed by COVID killed by the effects of the COVID. Because I haven't seen any medicine that cures COVID, but we have medicine that cures the effects of the COVID. What the COVID has destroyed, destructed, destroyed in our organism, you can look at cured. I actually came from Morocco. When I was uh, invited by the, the Royal Academy of the Kingdom, the, the, the Academy of the Kingdom of Morocco, to try to, to contribute to building what, what I call the political economy of health. Uh, in, in, in the very simple ways that uh, people have been dealing with health issues as side issues. Whereas capital, human capital, is the first capital we have. If you are not in good health, you cannot build anything. So good health is the prime premium of the value addition and in any value chains. So I was very pleased at being invited uh, to, to deliver a keynote uh, speech that generated actually the decision to install uh, a, a, an annual forum on that, where we will be surrounded by physicians, by surgeons, by epidemiologists and everything. And my job was to show them which way we can develop a political economy in that and make it a kind of a growth pole or, or, or growth center instead of being a dead weight. We're just going to give some subsidies or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and thanks to COVID, uh, as I said in my interview with the top, uh, COVID can be turned into a chance to happen because it has revealed our structural vulnerabilities, our vertical vulnerabilities, and it has now put us back to the world. And we are obliged to take the initiative to program and design our own development strategies. It's arguable that the Asian tigers, notably in China, had an equally dictatorial by Western standards center of government. They have they were always had strong men. Uh, they have might have had a period of a cunning strong man in the person of Deng Xiaoping, uh, who is less focused on autocratic rule, but who still used the levers of absolute control. Chinese state to turn the economy around from a conventional model, socialist model, to a model of state capitalism. What is it that the Asian tigers, such as Vietnam or China, Thailand, Singapore, perhaps not so much, but in the model, what did they get right, even under authoritarian systems of rule? that African countries did. Very, very interesting. I will, I will try to, to respond uh, using two pathways. What, what made uh, China uh, give the impression that they are ruled by strong men is actually about collective demand for, of, for strong institutions. This is because this institution, because China has billions of people. Do you believe one man can decide to dictate over billions of people? No. This is because maybe since Mao Zedong, they have paid their own way to state capitalism. Because China, since Mao Zedong has understood the role of capital accumulation as it was defined, described, described and explained by Karl Marx and 
the type of society that has been described in the in the uh, philosophy Alman, how do you call it, uh, German philosophy of 18th century. Karl Marx is the greatest capitalist, whereas people want to portray him as a communist. He was not a communist. Karl Marx was the person who explained how the accumulation of capital can be used to make an economy mushroom. The only issue that was a political one, this was the reality and the controversial reality between capital and labor. So he described it critically. Critically and scientifically. When the Bolsheviks under Lenin has decided to capture the politics by imposing the dictatorship of workers over the capital, Mao Zedong has understood that actually he has to develop a way of accumulating capital through a state capitalism, public capitalism. And that is the same philosophy of Mao Zedong that is governing China. So they took time to communicate with the masses, to get them to adopt their way to the capitalism by making sure that nobody will be left behind. But they knew there was a pathway to that. So, and see what happened. How many entrepreneurs, private entrepreneurs, has been fabricated by the government of China? That means they are not against capitalism, private entrepreneurship, but they have their own way to do it. So this is the reason why this man, what you call strange man, has contributed to reinforcing the institutions that are creating them. So there is a dialect between the institution and the man that incarnate them. Sometimes some of them have exaggerated and have been overthrown by the system. But there is one common vision in China of building state capitalism to become a popular capitalism. This is why now, when you come to, to, the, to the big uh, shops, luxury shops, you only see Chinese, you only see Asian people and how many billionaires they are created. So, but this is, these are the historical conditions in this part of the world that have developed and given this type of model. Africa cannot say this, we're going to go and copy the model in China. And to give you another example, now that is completely different, take the case of Switzerland. In Switzerland, for the last 300 years, no government has been overthrown, democratically I'm talking about. Because this is the confederation of independent states, they call Canton. But this is united by a collective approach and a collective consciousness to see what the people of Switzerland want to become. So this has structured their way to education, their way to vocational training, to instruction, to everything. Switzerland is governed at the federal level by seven big men that rotates all the time. One is becoming president a year and this is changing. But the same in also the, in, in the states, in the independent states. What makes them work together? You have three or four parties political parties with the different repartition of, of, of the seats in government, but they all look at the same direction because they have, they have the same culture. Their constitution translates the vision the people of Switzerland and the people of China have of their own future. And this is the type of common wisdom that generates, that perpetuates and that makes that sometimes you can see a, a person who wants to be playing the role of a strong man and everything, but the institutions are strong. So I gave you two opposite examples, Switzerland and China. You will go to Singapore, it's the same thing. Singapore was a place where several ethnic and tribes were coming to fight. Until a leader has decided not to take sides, but bring people together. 
helping people to divine design their common vision of their own future. Design the type of institution that fit that environment and that objective and the pursuit of this objective. And this is why they had the national consensus on the type of means they had to pull together to create a platform and grow up. That is the type of consensus that we don't have in Africa. Now, where even within individual African countries, in 55 and 4 of us, which one we were taking, you have such disagreement about the direction of national development or fears about a limited resource scheme. And so a tendency within our countries for people to want to try to get their man to the top position who will then become their guarantor of wealth in a direct, very crude trickle-down model to the exclusion of other countries. How possible is it for Africa to begin to, to, to forge um, a sense of common direction, as you described it, that somehow gives us those models appropriate to our lives uh, and defeats the Washington consensus that still seems to govern our economies? Yeah, look, I was saying if I was the president of Senegal, but I was say if I was the president of Ghana, if I was a politician in Ghana, the first thing, the only objective I would set to myself would be to have a national discussion on the economic model that the Ghanaians could agree upon to design their economic strategy in the most inclusive way. Because I have many uh, contenders, uh, many people who want to rule the country. They have their political party, they can go and visit their constituencies, talk, make promises. But there is no common direction for the Ghanaian people to know what they're going to make of their country. The national debate has to take place when there was in the 90s, when there was riots all over the place, people started to do national conference. But during the national conference, people in Africa were talking about how political elites were sharing the country. Political, professional politicians. But what would it be if in Ghana, in Canada, in Togo, everywhere, they decide to create a forum and say, we would like a large consultation. We're not talking only about politicians. We are talking with everybody who has an idea of how his own village should be developed, how his own district should be developed, how his own region should be developed. What would be the paradigm, which means the thinking framework, the thinking model that's going to be used to leverage our wealth and design our own instruments, transformational instrument to transform our environment. With nowadays, with the digital platforms and everything, you can have this type of dialogue very quickly, very broadly. And then you get some people to bring all these ideas together. Bottom up. From the bases to the top and get the idea of what could be done. And once you do that, then you know which type of institutions that you should develop to support this as an infrastructure. As a... Now, now, some would say that that's a very optimistic view of what's possible through a national dialogue. Here in Ghana, uh, there's a lot of talk about a lack of agreement on a, a common long-term development plan of the kind that China fall into the hands. 10-year model, 15-year model, 20, 50-year models of development on which there is consensus across the political spectrum and the business spectrum as well. There is, for example, here in Ghana, a 40-year development plan recently devised, and governments will tell you that their individual medium and short-term development plans, there is currently the um, 
coordinated program of social and economic policies that is a seven year uh, program to which the Parliament of Government is working. But that seven year plan fits into a 40 year development plan devised by a government of a different political economy. They would equally argue that when you go to base level and you ask people, how would you like your community to develop? It is always predicated on the idea of a state bringing money to create infrastructure, which the people then expect the state to subsidize and maintain for them. So how do you get the private sector, which at least in a country such as Ghana, Virtually everybody pays lip service to that. That has to be the motor for our development. For example, you want to industrialize a motor, a force has to come from the private sector. How do you unleash private sector energies in that kind of framework? Maybe you allow me to, to run the course of the reasoning I started, and I'll and I will I will end by giving you the answer because it is it is it is aligned. If you agree on an economic development model, bottom up, then you can discuss the type of institutions that you need to carry and frame this strategy. And then I would go as far as saying that we even need to frame the political life by saying if somebody claimed that he wanted to play a political role, he need to come with a development strategy that fits the general orientation that has been agreed. This is the way it works, right? This is the way it works. So you, you cannot just decide to say, okay, I have a 10 years plan, a 15 years plan, based on what? Two years, three years, five years means something. It doesn't come out of the air. But if, like in an enterprise, you develop a business plan, it is based on the reality of the enterprise, the realities of the market, the realities of your source of finance, the reality of your human resource management, and everything. Once you do this type of thing, then you can design in, in, in District A or District C which type of resources you will be working on supported by which type of infrastructure and who's going to fund this infrastructure because whenever you decide to fund infrastructure you need to know what would be the economic opportunities to be generated by this infrastructure and when you realize that there is a value in generating opportunities to be transformed by the private sector then you have a legitimacy to say this is worth funding and then you determine the source of funding. This is the way you work. So when you frame all the type of issues the way we discuss it this way, then the, the place of the informal sector, private sector, formal private sector, and everything falls in together. So we cannot make the economy of this national dialogue decentralized at the very granular level of the country based on the willingness to build our economies on their strengths. That you cannot make the economy of this dialogue. Otherwise, what you will have, this will be a party that will come here and win with their own economists, their own politicians, their own strategists, and come into the village and say, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do that. You will never gain national consensus on that. The type of national consensus and national wisdom and collective consciousness that you have in China, you have in Switzerland, you cannot build it top down. No, because if it is top down, that is you, me, and him. That decide we know better than them, and we come to tell them what to do. And if they, if they run our position, and in many cases this is like a referendum. You say somebody who write a referendum with several pages and several pages, and come and say people, you say yes or no. That is intellectual book. And this is the type of things we have been facing in Africa for too long. And if, like in the case of Senegal, we want to stop the riots, 
we need to address these issues in the most systemic and inclusive manner. Just to remind our viewers and listeners that you're tuned to Sunday night on Asase and where the guests of Dr. Tian have been Matina, the independent economist and thinker and development expert, who has been telling us about his vision of how African economies and how African nations develop their own development models legislated to our own conditions here. Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Um, I'm very glad that you raised uh, the question of youth and youth's role in all this, who, as you said, are getting the sort of sense of no longer being prepared to sit and accept the old development models uh, and take them for granted. Uh, now, but the West created its own development model, the Washington Consensus, as you said, just pre the end of the second world war, which has been imposed on us, largely to avoid war between European countries, the cause of the, the bloody outbreak of the second world war, the previous world war before that in 1914 to 1918. Africa is about to go through uh, what is just already experiencing a big demographic shift, where um, by 20 I believe up to a quarter of the world's youth will be based in Africa. Uh, soon thereafter, it will be up to half of the world's youth population. And already we're in a situation where 60% of the population in sub Saharan Africa is up to the age of 25. This, of course, has been helped by certain things that are developments, as in better health, our public health systems being at the root of human resource development. Better health care has resulted in lowering of maternal mortality rates, uh, and at the same time, there's a high population growth rate, which is what is leading to this demographic boom. But I wondered how you think practically speaking, in terms of taking that energy, that resource, that a new quick that Africa is going through can be used to unleash wealth creation. You know, uh, what I call globalism uh, is the type of things that led some people to kind of say that we are overpopulated in Africa. We are not. Africa is underpopulated. If you take the case of, of, of DRC, for instance, when you see the, the, the type of immensity of arable lands, you take the square meters, kilometers that we have and everything, and you take the density, it's very low. The population density in Africa is extremely low. So, that means that if we really have to apply development economics in our environment, we will even need to import labor force in food. So we don't have a demographic, what, what the UN people call demographic dividend, and they put it reverse. Because for me, a dividend is something that is positive. But some people may put in our mind that we needed to stop uh, making kids and this and that because they want to equate what they can give to the number of people they can feed. No. Me, my family has taught me not to spend what I have, but to go and earn what I want to spend. Put in flat terms, in terms of development, we need to create the wealth that can not only feed our people, can make them rich. And for that, to that end, we need to put our youth in contribution. What made China a developed country now? Because they use their, their population dividend, huge market. But the market is a, is a population that have a purchase power. When you generate economic activities in the most inclusive way, 
get people to participate, mushroom their purchase power. Then they become an emerging market. I saw some people say that emerging country, it does not mean anything. The word emerging country doesn't exist. What exists is emerging markets. An emerging market was suddenly created by the spillover effect of the Washington Consensus. That same Washington Consensus that has been contested by Donald Trump, in actual terms, both Trump administration and Biden administration are killing the Washington Consensus. Let me tell you how. Because the Washington Consensus was pushed by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Under the pressure of the lobby, financial lobbies, that, want, that wanted the international capital flows to fly everywhere. For that, they decided through movement of goods and services, for some reason, because when you produce in China, you would like to invade all markets. So you have to organize free movement of, of, of goods. Certain free, free movement of capital that allowed them to go and slave China and transform China into the factory of the world. Produce cheap there and bring them back to sell more expensive to make money. So what is the outcome of this Washington consensus? You go to New York, the infrastructure is down. Why? Because government has no money. And why government has no more money? Because most of the investors have split China. And this is where they are paying taxes, because government is getting money through taxes. Why, why COVID was a disaster? Because government became poor, thanks to the Washington Consensus that has helped China attract more investors. They didn't have money to entertain and maintain their, their sanitary services. Same thing with medicine. They went to rush to China, produce three, four times, ten times cheaper, and bring it back here. So, so it's arguable that having realized that the consensus is partly undoing their economic basis, uh, Western countries are going to pull back from that, are trying to pull back. You may argue that it's a bit too late in the day. Yeah. But uh, I wondered how... Given what you said about the need for purchasing power being a key element of economic development, even with the creation of the African continental free trade area and the great hope that certain economists and most people in business have presented it as a market of 1.4 billion people, you know, likely to become 2 billion by 2050. The African Development Bank talking about how with the right inputs in agriculture, you can have a $1 trillion agribusiness industry in sub-Saharan Africa by 2030. If you have people who essentially do not have spending power, however uh, many there are of them, what use is an institution such as the African Continental Future where we're going to be? You know, this is all business. This is all business. This is not because that you decree that you're going to have Africa free continental trade happen. That happens before before uh, we decreed it that Africa would be one common market. Teko was was he? Sadek was he? Even Wemu was here. Even in those small countries, did you see the goods flows? Normally, there is free movement of goods and capital in there. What is happening? And you think that you're just going to make it continental that is going to flow? No. When you integrate a function, you want to see how far you can use that function to transform your environment. It's easier to do it with small country than do it with the whole continent together. Why what we, what we try to do with three, four, six countries didn't work, and we think that when it becomes 54 countries, it's going to work. This is why I say this is business. One thing is to open up the environment, the space. Another thing is to have production functions that will support trade functions. Without production function, internal value chains, regional value chains, 
that free space will only allow production that are being done elsewhere to come and fly freely in Africa. So let's be honest. So this is why you see most of these organizations trying to say we're going to support African free continental plant. Let them support us to industrialize by transforming our own resources. Then Ghana will have appetite to fully collaborate with Togo and everything and open barriers. I remember when uh, the late President Baba Karinyai of African Development Bank in the 90s asked me to go and discuss with some of the head of states to understand why uh, the, the Abuja Treaty, the Abuja Treaty uh, couldn't be implemented. Because the Abuja Treaty is the ancestor of the after, actually after originated from that. After is just an implementation. It took them years and ten, tens of years to sign it, but it was there for it, right? When I talked to President Bongo, the late President Bongo, he told me, Pam, when you say we open up our borders, everybody agrees because nobody can say no. But people will tell you yes, but they will not open. Say why? My small Gabon, with one million inhabitants, with oil, with all these resources. If you don't give prospects to the bigger DRC people, the people there, they will come and flow with my country. Tell me which political leader will accept to have his country being overflowed by population coming from countries where they are fleeing poverty. If you want us to open up that means we have to distribute growth potentials within our countries. So you can grow Africa, you can make Africa a formidable level for development if it would be the area where you will distribute growth potentials, complementing growth potentials within the Africa countries. But distributing these growth potentials is about economic policy, infrastructure policy, institutional policy, and all, all like. So it boils down again <laughs> to having a vision of our economic development, what we want to become tomorrow, based on our resources. Because before you go and seek help, you need to leverage your own strengths. This is what we have been doing. If I was a political leader, I would be ashamed of going and asking some help, whereas I know I can engineer him. When my father-in-law was Prime Minister of the US, he came to Japan. He came, was stopped by Switzerland. He, he, came, he, he, he was literally crying. He came to visit us in Switzerland and said, I am ashamed of myself. I said, why? I said, I went to Japan as a Prime Minister of the US to discuss which way they can help us. And after I finished my lives, my talk, they gave me the resource mapping of DRC. Show me whatever they have in every provinces. And they gave me what Japan had. All these islands, nothing in them. And they say, so, would you like us, would you tell us how we could help you with all these resources that we have? We don't have resources. So which type of help are we expecting from us? And this is, he told me, this is why I decided to stop by Switzerland and talk to you. Because the type of economic rebellion you, my son-in-law, has been doing all the time, I know now what it means, uh, being the prime minister of the ASEAN was in 1980. So that is the paradox. I would be ashamed of myself going and saying I'm needing help instead of proposing partnership around the transformation of my resources. 
my life, my wife used to like President Abdul so much. As a DRC, as coming from DRC, is what the desolation we had in DRC. But the day she saw President Abdul showing his hand through the TV and saying, Come and help us. We lost all the esteem. We need to work to be proud of ourselves. If we need to qualify to be respected, dignified human being, we need to claim our dignity ourselves. Because we have brains, we have hearts, we have guts. It doesn't take any more, anything more to build our own country than we have to. Captain Batiam, he, he spoke uh, very feelingly there about the work that Africa needs to do to take control of its resources and develop a homegrown model of development that can actually unleash the kind of productive use of our resources that we need to see. Um, you've done notably work in Ghana on developing special economic zones in the past and the Ghana Gateway to Africa project. How do you feel special industrial zones and the sort of value chain development in which you specialize can actually begin to harness some of the resources we could take another African country or maybe talk about the partnership between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire and Coco. Okay, that is that is that is very very reviving uh, <laughs> following what we have discussed already. I mean we have a model. We have done something between 2005, 2004, and 2010 that was very successful. We have invented our own model of economic zone based on the paradigm that consists in building our economies on their strengths. <laughs> the special economic zone model that we piloted under the gateway is not a copy or a cut and paste of any model in the world. This was consistent and congruent with the situation on the ground that dictated our strategy. And I'm very happy to see the Ghana government deciding to develop six new special economic zones slash industrial cities. And when people see special economic zones slash industrial cities or industrial park, it only means that it is not a one-size-fits-all. That means there is three philosophy. First philosophy is the special economic zone itself. And the way we talk about special economic zone in Ghana is to build on the speciality and the specificity of that specific zone. Because each of the zones have their own potentials have their own challenges and need to be dealt with with appropriate policies, measures, instruments, and interventions. Second thing, we do slash industrial cities because we want mass production to be at the core of building new cities or reforming existing cities. Because we don't want the cities to be just a place to go and sleep. We want people to come and settle there because they can have a job there. They can have a purchase power that can make them afford urban development and access to property. Then we talk industrial park also, because this mass production has to take place in the place, in an environment when you provide infrastructure, education, any type of ingredients that could contribute to building an economic and social formation. So this is why uh, when people read now, the, the rhetoric is not just about special economic zone, because there is not one type of special economic zone in say. It is the beginning of the paradigm shift in terms of inventing appropriate solutions based on appropriate problems that we are we are trying to deal with. So the question is now how to do it. And I think that uh, last time I was here with the team, 
uh, we have come to the conclusion uh, that we needed to also to build the capacity that is necessary. I believe that uh, both Ghana Fison's authority, that actually I think the name has to change because we have outdated the free zone concept since the Ghana Gateway. This is why an enclave is no more a free zone. A uh, uh, free zone enterprise can be anywhere in the country. So when this has is no, no more exception, so there is no need to say free zone. Second thing is not a place that is free, 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 free to say free zone. No, 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 there is nothing free. In the concept of special economic zone, we need to provide processes with platforms of externalities, platform of competitiveness that would make them interested to come and settle in these zones because you are providing them with their means of, of entrepreneurship, right? So this is not like the free zone, old free zone model where people say, oh, you, you, you tax free, uh, duty free and all this type of nonsense. It's not just about tax waivers. Yeah. And I actually, I, I am against tax waiving. We are nations under construction. Governments need money to build hospitals, need money to build schools and everything. And these money should be generated by vibrant economic activities that pay taxes. So the question is that which type of fiscality you will need to do. I have a sense of unfinished work because when we entered this, this when I was asked to lead the team uh, to work on a value proposition to see how we're going to market uh, Ghana special economic zone, there is an element that was not in the terms of reference, which is what I call in French droit de développement, which means a fiscality of development. Which type of fiscal approach, which type of fiscality, taxes, type of regime of taxes you need to have? My sense for me is that we need to have a dynamic approach to that, where government can even give incentives to investors to build the public infrastructure and recoup, recoup it through taxes with a lag effect. I have designed the whole modelization on that to see how it works, but this was not within the scope of this work. The second thing that I discussed even today with a gentleman and that gives me appetite to, to be even more entrepreneurial, I would launch a program in as much as African countries possible of what I call logistic city. Because when you see what is happening now, when you see Amazon working, it's all based on logistics. Supply chains. Yes, supply chain is the chain, but it's not the only thing. The supply, as I said, it will supply, and the chain is the vehicle. But you need to have some type of infrastructures that will be the point of convergence of these chains. For instance, you go to Switzerland, you have big warehouses by DHL, hubs. So when you order by your phone, with your phone or you order uh, with a click on the computer, the whole system is moving and the goods can be shipped from Switzerland, from Italy, from East. So this logistic mapping uh, has made it possible for people to kind of uberize international trade. So I was thinking of, of developing a logistic city in Senegal to make it a good distribution zone where you can address supplies and demand the whole world, but for enterprises, small and medium scale enterprises, to give them the opportunity to outsource the raw material they need at the retail price. If we succeed doing that by line of productions, by sector of activities, and so on and so forth, we will democratize entrepreneurship. 
because we will internalize, internalize the national disparities within our countries. Is it not inevitable that at some point in time, Dr. Tiam is going to become a politician standing on a podium looking for <laughs> election somewhere in Senegal? I am not sure that one that going to happen that way because I'm already a politician. You are a politician once you have a voice, once you want to wait uh, on the destiny of your continent and your, and your country in particular. But being a politician is not just taking office. I had a very interesting conversation with Alan Cherimatan today about that, who is a very, very long-standing friend. We did the Ghana Trade and Investment Gateway together, and, and we continued under Hannah Tete uh, and, uh, and John Mahama uh, when he was vice president. He was, he was the, 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 the chairman of the steering committee of the Gateway Project. Uh, but I started it with Kufor and, and Cherry Matin. And uh, he was asking me the same question. He said, everybody is expecting you in politics. I say, my friend, I'm already in politics. I've always been in politics. The only difference is that I will not be running for office like you will be running on, for office, like you tried to run for office already. I want to wait on politics by being the guardian of the temple of orthodoxy in developing our continent. So I want to be equidistant from the churches, political churches. But I will be the watchdog to show direction, to contribute, to indicate the direction to the people. Doing so, I'm going to weaponize with the wisdom and the knowledge our populations, our African youth, for them to be watchful of what is being done with their resources. I want to equip them with the knowledge that make them aware of any deviation that would be done with their resources. Now some would argue that that's pretty much the position that somebody like Bola Ahmed Tinubu attempted to adopt in Nigeria for a very long time and at the end of the story he was obliged to enter conventional politics regardless of whether he wanted to or not and become the hands-on person which is why he's now president of Nigeria. I wish I will not follow that path because I am very jealous of my prerogative and independence. But I cannot say never, no, but I am reinventing myself not to jump in that. This is why I am very open and very proud to say I'm, I'm a binational. And I know to many Africans when you say I am also proud to be a Swiss, that this is the best, best way for them to consider that you will not be part of them. So maybe this is why I'm emphasizing because I firmly believe that if I really want to do politics, I have to weigh on the way we do politics by serving our constituencies through the transformation of our resources to get everybody on the pattern of shared prosperity. And this is why uh, I avoid as much as possible to make judgmental uh, judgment about who is right, who is wrong. Because the minute people suspect you of having sympathy for one party versus another, then they try to discredit you. And I think credibility is essential. And I'm happy with that. You see what I write every day. You see how many people read it. And if I go to the demographics, I can tell you, minister of this country is reading minister, so I'm weighing on politics. You weigh on politics, you do politics. For the time being, that is my stand, and at my age, I think that if I continue that path within five, six years, I will be even disqualified for politics, which will be good things. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that that's going to happen. Uh, but our great thanks to you, unfortunately, we have to call our conversation to a close. It's been fascinating talking with you about your idea for a new model of economic development for Africa, 
uh, and we, we do hope that the politicians are not only going to listen, uh, as well as the business actors are not going to just listen, but also act on some of the ideas that you propose. Thank you. So our great thanks to Patlin Batiam, the development economist and industrial value chain development expert, for that fascinating insight into changing balance of world power, the collapse of Washington consensus, and most importantly, what Africa can do to arm its people to create the wealth that we need to pull this country up to the next level of development. Our great thanks for joining us on Sunday night on Asase. On camera and sound today has been Dennis Asante, and providing logistics has been George Boati. And I've been your host, Nanaya Metsa. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Join us again next week at the same time for more tales of this wonderful continent we call Africa.